So there was a question of uh, Sandra and about uh, shamanic traditions, um, mainly about the Middle American Toltec traditions. Um, roughly, if you uh, uh, if you look at it, there are different egregores involved also in different uh, shamanic traditions. Um, the North American tradition is basically very much connected to the uh, Pleiades. So this is a group of stars and there's an egregore there um, of that civilization and they um, establish and re-establish um, some yeah, uh, shamanic traditions, nature-oriented traditions on Earth. And um, according to Vladimir, uh, in the South American and Middle American traditions there is a lot more focus on astral traveling and using various plants to uh, make astral travelings. And um, he said that the reason for this is that um, the egregores which are connected to the uh, Toltec tradition and South American traditions have been largely abandoned by their original egregores or the original egregores have uh, exploded and uh, as a result of that the, um, the members of those egregores are also a little bit um, yeah, lost uh, uh, cosmically and uh, that gives them a lot of freedom, a lot of ability to move around and explore the whole cosmos because they're not anchored to their egregore. And that is both an advantage and a disadvantage. Um, are there specific experiences or questions you would like to ask about Sandra? No, it's not a bad thing. Did you see it? Hello. Yeah, I, um, see also a question by uh, Ninka mm -hmm. about exploding egregores. Um, basically, an egregore can be seen um, just like a family or a company or a political party. Uh, it's a collection of individuals. And these individuals are trying to work together in a certain organization to achieve a certain goal. And in the same way as a family can split or fall apart, or a political party can, or a, a business can, in the same way also an egregore can. Um, in general, this is due to the um, they're becoming there is too much uh, internal tension uh, within the egregore. Uh, in general, an egregore has a certain uh, level of consciousness, a certain uh, layer where most of its members are. Some members are a bit further, some are a bit behind, but the differences are not too big. And if the differences can uh, become very big, uh, then the egregore needs to be quite old and well structured to prevent it from falling apart. Um, because people on different layers of consciousness have very different ideas of how to achieve the same goal. Um, and because of that, yeah, uh, tensions and ruptures can, uh, can start. Okay, I see another question coming up. So... Okay. The, um, this is also the reason that many egregores um, try to defend themselves. Um, uh, yeah, some of you were also there uh, a bit, yeah, a bit more over a year ago in the seminar in La Vascane. Um, where also uh, then uh, an egregore uh, complained to me that uh, members were being initiated which were not correct for that egregore. Um, so in general an egregore has uh, certain standards for its, its membership. 
and uh, this is also one of the reasons that uh, Vladimir uh, stopped giving initiations in certain egregores because the egregore itself or members of the egregore complained about the new membership and I know that uh, Vladimir even um, yeah at times although very rarely has de-initiate people so removed initiations from people because yeah they were yeah uh, either the initiation was not beneficial to them or it was too dangerous for the egregore to allow this person in um, this is also how egregores um, fight with each other often they try to infiltrate each other and spy on each other and then to sabotage from within um, Yes, um, it's, there's a question here about the intensity. Um, yeah, th that is always a problem when working with shamanic tradition. Um, and this is because of the, uh, also the phases of, uh, of spiritual evolution. Um, so we talked earlier about the uh, different messiahs with the first messiah being the messiah of strength, of power and uh, this is also the messiah of the uh, shamanic tradition so it is not a messiah of love or harmony of knowledge uh, within these uh, shamanic traditions it's mainly based on power and um, ultimately the goal of the shamanic traditions is to make the spirit so powerful that it doesn't matter what happens on a physical level uh, or on an emotional level and uh, that the per just to give the person a total control over their emotions uh, ultimately also over their bodies, over their thoughts uh, to use everything as uh, a tool for survival and in uh, shamanism there is generally a lot of fighting um, uh, just like animals, shamans are territorial and the territory can be determined um, yeah, either by geographical location or certain people or places are claimed by one or several shamans. And just like with animals, generally shamans show their strength, show their power and threaten the other person. And yeah, um, after this display of mutual strength, if the difference is big enough, then one shaman will back off, will allow the other person to have that territory but if the shamans are closely matched then sometimes they will um, yeah it will come to a fight to determine who is the strongest and by fighting you uh, they learn from each other so in the tradition and in many older uh, traditions also in Judaism it is very usual to fight with your teacher um, because the teacher is actually uh, there to uh, yeah to have uh, to pose a, a challenge but every time you fight them you learn something new about your weaknesses or you can see how the teacher uses his or her strength also about 15 years ago in the school um, it was very difficult for like the more powerful people uh, like Galina to uh, visit the school because everybody would try to pick a fight with them uh, to learn from the, the strong people in the school. Um, yeah, I was not in uh, La Fascalne uh, uh, this year, so I don't know what exactly happened. Um, but what is very important, if you are, um, yeah, in a way, working with aggression, with fear, um, with lust, with all the, these intense energies, which have a lot of power, in them is that uh, uh, there is a tendency to move towards lower energies, towards lower vibrations, um, because these lower vibrations 
um, in a way can push away higher energies and in a shamanic battle there's always the risk that the two combatants will go on lower and lower and lower vibrations and ultimately both of them will be harmed or they will get caught up in a lot of fear or anger or stress and it is very difficult to recover from that. Um, so with the battle uh, uh, it is generally good to have like a short battle and then time to recuperate or to rest and to rebuild yourself because if you fight continuously your uh, awareness is going to descend quite strongly and also the lower you go in vibration um, and the more you get focused on power the more likely it is also that you will slip into the dark cosmos um, and this is also a very uh, important distinction to make in shamanism um, because the light side of, of shamanism um, is very much involved in um, uh, in self-improvement, in yeah, increasing your own control, your own power um, and also in cooperating with the other powers which exist, elemental powers, natural powers. Um, the dark side of shamanism is more interested in appropriating power instead of developing your own power, stealing power from others or using other people's power or the, pl the powers of a certain place and uh, um, yeah, possibly by trickery, possibly by consent. But uh, ultimately the development is external and not internal. So this is a very important distinction between the light side of shamanic traditions and the dark side of shamanic traditions. And um, one of the comments of Vladimir about the Toltec tradition is that this is very much uh, called current school. And, uh, most shamanic traditions are also cold current, uh, but yeah, that also makes it a little bit more dangerous because the heart and love and compassion is not strongly involved as a guiding principle. And some of the shamanic traditions have evolved to um, yeah absorb in a way the teachings of the uh, of the last Messiah, but yeah, some of them haven't. And this was also the very much the mission of uh, uh, the Spanish missionaries, of Christopher Columbus, to connect the existing traditions in North and South America with the Christ impulse, but unfortunately it yeah, became racial genocide and extermination of that culture instead of en enriching them with a the Christian impulse. Okay. Um, so are there more questions or comments on the uh, shamanic issue? Okay. Oh, some coming. I'll wait a bit for a translation. also within shamanism um, it is very easy to do summonings uh, power attracts power and uh, shamans are generally powerful and so they tend to attract also powerful beings it's very easy for a shaman to invite a, a powerful spirit um, controlling that spirit and or controlling the power you summon that is quite difficult and um, especially um, like Western European shamans who haven't really grown up in a shamanic tradition uh, are often uh, ill-prepared, they do rituals and summon powers which they cannot completely control or comprehend. Uh, so this is one of the mistakes which is often made in a shamanic tradition. Um, the working with the power animal is uh, uh, more often done in the uh, North American tradition. Um, the power animal has uh, basically um, uh, yeah, several functions. 
The first thing is actually the stage at which you attract the power animal. Um, the, uh, every animal has a certain strategy, has certain tools for survival, a certain method of dealing with problems. And uh, depending on your own natural personality, uh, such an animal may recognize like, okay, you are trying to be like me and you're trying to solve problems in the same way as I solve problems. And uh, because of that similarity, it may feel uh, interested in uh, working together with you as a teacher or as a guide. Um, if your personality is not strongly enough developed um, or it is shifting too much, then um, generally an animal uh, yeah, will not come to you or it will only stay for a short time. A power animal should be a lifelong gu uh, guide. So in general you can say that uh, power animals don't come to people until roughly around the age of 35 when the personality is really strong and stabilized. And um, sometimes they come a bit earlier, but uh, yeah, sometimes a bit later, but this is usually when the animal takes an interest. Um, also the person has to be active energetically. If they're not trying to do something, solve some problem, then there is no need to have a guide or a supporter. So it is very much depending on your activity um, and your, um, yeah, uh, your own nature that an animal spirit might or might not be attracted to you. Um, so in the tradition I come from, the Cherokee tradition, uh, it is actually not done for you to try to get a power animal. Uh, you just uh, have to allow the animal to uh, to pick you when it wants to. So the uh, dominance is really um, of the decision is really with the animal, not with the human. Um, this is also uh, in the Turkey tradition very much out of respect. Uh, you don't try to force things before you are ready. Um, the power animals have some uh, very nice uh, strategies. So if you're in a problem, uh, problematic situation, you can ask the animal to come into your body and guide you or take over for a while. So that the uh, animal can in a way show you how things are done. Uh, many shamans also heal in this way. They have a healing totem, a healing animal, and they allow this spirit to come into their body and the spirit performs the healing or does it together with them and then uh, leaves again. Um, it is possible for one person to have several power animals and these usually represent different parts of their personality. Um, depending on a situation like a person might need strength or might need humor or flexibility and uh, usually a different animal um, teaches those qualities uh, to their human. Um, and what is also important is to uh, give attention to those qualities in yourself regularly so to maintain an inner harmony because otherwise also the power animals will leave if they feel they're not needed or not called upon. Um, a power animal is actually uh, very comparable to a spirit guide uh, but generally on a slightly higher level of, um, of awareness. So they are very connected to the collective consciousness of their species and they can thus draw upon a lot of knowledge and power. So in a way, um, like your guide can be, for instance, a dog um, and it is very much dog as a power animal, which is important and then to a small degree your own power guide is more an individualized version of it. So they're not nearly as individualized as humans, but there are differences between uh, power animals of different shamans. Um, one other practice which uh, can be done is the power animal can also teach you how to uh, transform your energy body to make it more like it. So uh, one of the uh, workshops I, uh, I gave a few times is also shamanic dance or shamanic postures. Um, I actually forgot a lot about them myself. But uh, in shamanic traditions, 
you try to stand or to move like a certain animal and by doing that for about 20 minutes you adopt more and more strongly also the energy structure of the animal and the spirit can come deeper into your body thereby also transforming your energy body and, and cleaning it and making it more flexible so these uh, shamanic dances they are not just to honor the, the animal but also they are uh, very healing uh, they also give insight um, but this is more the North American tradition rather than the Middle American tradition. Um, some things which are very specific for the Middle American tradition is that they um, they tried to create their own uh, ladder. Uh, so we talked in previous lessons about uh, the Golden Ladder or Jacob's Ladder by which uh, angels can uh, come to the earth and also spirits can ascend to the heavens. Um, in the Middle American tradition they also created a ladder and generally by sacrifice. Say the, they would um, sacrifice beings with uh, uh, more or less over, over, uh, overlaying levels of consciousness. So they would sacrifice yeah, corn and plants, uh, different types of animals, humans and uh, in this way they also primitive humans are more highly evolved humans in different states of awareness and by this way they were creating a ladder or these spirits of the beings which were sacrificed created a ladder uh, for people to ascend to a higher level of consciousness or to um, also for higher spirits to come down using that ladder so it is kind of like a, a bucket line uh, where uh, it is not really a road which you can travel very easily as an individual spirit but all these spirits in the holy places they can pick up an energy and give it to the next higher or lower energy and in this way these holy sites could be energized um, it has to be noted that actually this uh, uh, tradition of uh, creating holy places in, in that way um, is very <laughs> different from um, uh, the, the, the Templar tradition. Um, so the, the Templars are working with, uh, with the Golden Ladder in, in creating uh, uh, basically a, a reaching out of lower dimensions and higher dimensions reaching down. So there is a motion out of the two extremes which kind of connects in the middle. And uh, this is uh, the Middle American tradition is much more mechanical. It doesn't depend on higher powers or lower powers uh, trying to do this. It very much depends on the humans who use their knowledge and skill to uh, to create this. So in that, it's much more mechanical. So a much more hermetical tradition. This is also why in the uh, uh, in the school. Uh, the Toltec tradition is yeah, much more favored over other shamanic traditions because of its hermetic nature. Okay. Anything more about this subject? Oh, something more coming. Wait a bit to see. Okay. Ah, yes, the safety techniques. Um, yes, well, to put it quite bluntly, uh, shamanism is not safe. 
Um, shamans tend to fight with each other a lot and they tend to use dark magic a lot. So um, in shamanic settings the same precautions you would take against uh, dark magic should also be taken. So um, don't allow anybody to uh, affect your food or drink. Uh, don't allow anybody to touch um, energetic objects, especially things you wear. Uh, be very cautious of people who are touching you physically. Um, be very cautious when your attention is low because of drugs or drinking or if you're tired or sleepy um, because these are actually the times when yeah, challenges can come, can arise. Um, for uh, the, the person itself not to slide down into the dark side of the shamanic tradition. Um, my own teacher um, uh, yeah, had me um, uh, yeah, demanded some vows of me because otherwise I would not be taught because it would be too dangerous to give this knowledge or power to a person who would abuse it. Uh, so one of the vows I, uh, I took was actually also never to use the power of the shamanic tradition for myself. It is, uh, I only invite power or call upon power um, uh, if it is to serve somebody else. And the other thing is I never call upon uh, power which has no purpose. So collecting power, collecting energy just to have it handy uh, is very dangerous because the power itself will want to manifest and it will yeah, um, it manifest if you want it to or not. Um, so in general if there is a problem and I lack the power to solve it myself uh, then I will call upon uh, shamanic power or make a trance journey or do something else and all the power I gather in that ritual or in that trance journey needs to be immediately spent. If I have power left over I need to release that power instead of hold on to it. Otherwise it is very easy to become too obsessed and too connected to all kinds of powers and thereby move into the dark cosmos. Um, what is very important also in, um, uh, in a shamanic setting is that you follow, the, uh, uh, yeah, the, follow your own spirit guide. Uh, because also in shamanic trance journeys there are dangers. And things which happen on an energetic level they also affect you. Uh, so you can get healed by a trance journey but you can also get hurt by a trance journey. Um, so never go on a shamanic uh, journey or retreat or anything else without indeed consulting your spirit guides or your, uh, your power animal. But if you go on a trance journey, first thing you do is find your power animal and uh, also listen to it if it tells you not to go somewhere or not to do something. Um, it is usually wise not to. Um, because um, your spirit can get damaged or can get fractured or split up if uh, a trance journey doesn't go well. Um, other things which uh, are part of the Cherokee tradition is that in a trance journey you should not work with insects and you should not work with metals. Um, the reason for this is that um, the level of awareness and also the uh, energetic flexibility of insects and metals is very low. So they're very static, very mechanical, uh, very unaware compared to your own being. Uh, but that doesn't mean they're not very powerful. Uh, and uh, if you connect with them you can easily get trapped in their layer of consciousness or their flow of power which gives you a lot of power but at the cost of your own flexibility and your own freedom. Uh, so this is very much a trade where you yeah, give up your power, your independence or your independence in exchange for power. Uh, so those are some important uh, safety techniques to, to think of.
Okay, um, it is said that malevolent spirits abide only in the middle world, not in the upper. Um, I wish that were so. It is not true, unfortunately. Um, so it is very much... Uh, uh, there is light and darkness on all levels of, uh, of the cosmos. Um, there is also um, uh, enlightened masters who yeah, serve the dark cosmos or work with the dark cosmos or for the dark cosmos. So a higher uh, yeah, world is not by the definition a safer world. But the higher worlds often have a lot less interest in manifesting themselves into descending or falling down into our level of consciousness while the lower worlds want to get into our level of consciousness. Um, so if a lower spirit comes it is not very likely to leave of its own accord while a higher spirit will not want to stay of its own accord. Uh, spirits of the middle world, they are the most powerful um, because they belong on our level of consciousness on our level of energy, so you cannot yeah, send them away and they don't need anything to stay here like the spirit from the lower worlds do. Um, so this is what makes spirits of the uh, yeah, middle worlds kind of tricky to deal with. Um, there's also the question of, indeed, uh, Okay, so let me get that straight. Um, so it is here said that the upper world is related to spirit guides and the lower world to power animals. It is actually the other way around. <laughs> um, so the, uh, you know, on the level of unconsciousness or subconsciousness and elemental powers and the very primitive nature powers which are connected to the elements, these belong to the lower world in shamanic tradition. Uh, our own spirit guides, our, uh, our ancestors, uh, tribal elders, um, other humans, uh, also a lot of um, yeah, uh, nature spirits of mountains, of trees, of lakes, of rivers, of oceans. They all belong to the middle world. <coughs> and in the upper world there are the power animals and later on also the gods and the goddesses when they were introduced on earth. Uh, so um, animals are seen as uh, higher um, than uh, humans and this is because also on a harmonic level, a harmonic vibration, their ability to connect to the higher consciousness, their ability to cooperate with uh, higher powers, with gods and goddesses is greater than that of humans. Uh, because they don't have the ego and other blockages which humans do have. So they're actually more integrated into higher worlds while we are in more separated and therefore become more part of the middle world as humans. Um, so insect, insects and metals are considered to be very much part of the lower world. Uh, reptiles are considered to be just like any other animal um, so they're also seen as a part of the of the higher world. So, uh, so mammals, uh, fish, amphibians, birds, they're all seen as uh, yeah. Uh, their spirits are seen as part of the higher world, and they come down in, sometimes in physical bodies, and then also just like us become part of the middle world. But their natural state is more um, yeah more high than ours. And humans used to be also very much more in the upper world, but through the process of individualization and the development of our mind, our thoughts, we are separating ourselves. And ultimately we need to yeah, learn how to use our personalities, our egos and our thoughts in such a way that they're only a benefit and not a hindrance anymore. So this is still a process of spiritual evolution. So we have some things which they don't have, but because we are so unskilled in using them in the correct way, they're more of a hindrance than a benefit on a spiritual level. So the question is, what about the snake? Um, the snake is, 
uh, a special kind of animal, as uh, in a way all burrow burrowing animals are. So, uh, like uh, bears, um, but also you have the, the crown squirrels, uh, rabbits, mice, uh, all animals which dig holes. Um, the, uh, uh, the, in a way, the, the surface of the earth is also seen as our, our surface uh, level of awareness. And by being able to burrow or to go under rocks or into the ground, you can actually go into the subconscious. Um, so the snake is seen as a very powerful uh, healing animal because it can solve problems which exist on a subconscious level. Um, so just like bear, uh, they are very good at, at psychological problems, psychological healing. Uh, the snake has one other advantage, in a way it sheds its skin, so it is very much able to uh, to let go of old things. It is very much about cleaning, about purifying, also about wisdom, about recognizing the value and the worth of something. While uh, bear is a bit more primitive, it's much more about power and focus and uh, taking your time. Uh, snake is seen as much more flexible, as a more powerful totem than, uh, than bear in that way. So it is very different from the uh, Christian perspective where um, yeah, uh, snakes, uh, bats and cats are seen as very evil. Um, in uh, shamanism, uh, basically all animals are seen as positive and good, um, but some are more easy or difficult to work with. Um, so, for instance, raccoon and coyote, uh, they're well known for their humor, which also means they can play tricks on humans. Uh, to deceive them or to, uh, yeah, but also to help them to develop their intelligence. Um, so using riddles and uh, things like this. So every animal has a different path they can uh, guide you on. Okay, um, so there's another uh, question about um, uh, the snake. In ayahuasca ceremonies they are mentioned, seen for example, or with mushrooms. Are they to be avoided or does it depend on the snake itself? Well, um, what's very important is basically that uh, in the purely uh, shamanic tradition all animals are seen as positive, as helpful. Um, a lot of the uh, shamanic traditions have become uh, mixed with Christian traditions and in Christian traditions they um, in a way start putting labels on things so um, in a Christian tradition if something is indeed showing up as a bat or a snake or a wolf um, that is a symbol that it is evil or the devil or a bad spirit or something like that so it depends very much on what tradition the shaman is working with or connected with uh, to correctly um, yeah, match the signs. But also it depends on your personal experience, so what the, yeah, the animal means to you. Um, what is uh, also a little bit confusing is that often in uh, trans journeys, the animal will fight with you or will eat you or you will eat it or uh, something like this. But this is not to be yeah, construed as something negative. It is uh, to be construed as a method of becoming one or getting to know each other or uh, joining. Um, because by fighting each other you both show yourself, you manifest yourself. And by eating it or by being eaten you absorb the power or you allow that power to come into you or the other way around you become part of the, the collective consciousness of for instance the wolf or the snake or the whatever you're eaten by so this is not something to be uh, feared um, what is uh, uh, yeah i've never had real problems with any animal spirit or uh, or something like that usually the evil spirits with, uh, which did show up 
usually took more the form of rot or decay or um, bones, uh, like things which have no uh, no life force, which are not growing, which are not moving forward, but are moving backward. So this is to me how a lot of symbolism shows up in the uh, in the trance journeys I do, and it's very important also before you do a mushroom or ayahuasca or other uh, journey to get your own uh, make contact with your own spirit guide um, in theory the shaman who's leading the ceremony uh, should protect the space should cleanse all the participants before the ceremony and also keep the space and the participants clean during the ceremony uh, because a lot of yeah uh, yeah subconscious things and junk can come up or can come out but if the shaman is not skilled enough or strong enough, then certain yeah, things cannot come out or, uh, because yeah, it is not, the situation is not right for them to come out yet. So then certain things remain unsolved or in the worst case they do come out, but they affect the whole group or other people can get affected by it because the shaman is unable to maintain control over the space. Um, in general, it is safer to work with a smaller group, or the shaman needs to have uh, be very strong, or have several helpers um, to help, yeah, protect the space. Um, it is not enough to uh, to perform a ceremony, or to sing songs, or to pray together. Uh, the shaman really has to be strong enough, or the priest or priestess has to be strong enough to keep control over the group during the ceremony while lots of stuff is going on. So preparation is part of the story but not the whole of the story. So if you feel that the shaman or priest or priestess is yeah, lacking in power, um, then it might not be very safe to, uh, to join in that ritual. Uh, should one do a shamanic journey together with his or her power animal due to safety reasons? Yes, always. Um, especially like if you do it yourself, you can do it alone. But if you um, use a plant or an animal uh, substance to help you, so a psychedelic substance, then you should always do it. Um, because um, Psychedelic substances can work in two ways. Either they amplify your own energy, so they give your energy body a different vibration, which throws you into that other level of consciousness, and or they remove your energetic defenses, so you cannot keep out things from other levels of consciousness. Um, some people tend to combine it, so they would smoke marijuana to in a way remove your defenses, so other dimensions can come to you, and then use ayahuasca to yeah, open you up and throw you up into these higher levels of consciousness and uh, the, these effects add to each other so that makes the journey much stronger or more intense um, but if your own defenses are down you can experience more you can get deeper healings because you're not blocking yourself but it can also be more dangerous because you have no energetic defenses um, also if you have traveled more often into a certain dimension it is not so necessary because you know that dimension you know the spirits there you know the creatures there uh, you can be safe there it is like being around your own home but especially if you are taking a drug for the first time um, it is very necessary to have indeed uh, a shaman or uh, uh, to guide you one-on-one -on -one or to have um, uh, a, a spirit guide or power animal who will uh, teach you or help you and keep you from uh, floating away or losing your focus. Um, as always, self-remembrance is the key. Um, it doesn't matter if you're drunk or angry or gaming or whatever, playing around. Um, you should always start your shamanic journey with a focus, with an intention of what you're trying to do, what you're after. And no matter what happens, and things can get very distractive, you should always go back to your intention or try to hold on to it. And this is also something an animal can help you with. 
if you talk with the animal and talk with the plant before your journey and explain them like okay this is why I'm making this journey this is what I'm trying to achieve and you float away in these other dimensions then the plant and can throw you or focus your energy more to the space where you need to be and the animal can also guide you back or bring you back uh, yeah, if you're going off, the, off your path or missing your aim or missing your goal so working with an animal in the ceremony really increases the effectiveness a lot okay um, gosh yeah uh, more questions and what about birds yeah okay um, birds are um, very much seen as being connected to uh, to greater spirits um, so the birds are often uh, uh, seen as carrying messages or uh, impulses from uh, different egregores they can also carry impulses from gods or goddesses or also from greater spirits like spirits of great lakes or seas oceans and mountains um, so the birds often have messages on a very individual level um, and birds uh, so they translate higher powers to more individual practical knowledge uh, so they often give warnings the owl is very famous for giving warnings the raven is very famous for bringing messages from people who died or ascended masters or gods and goddesses um, the bird is also very much a symbol of initiation of allowing you or helping you to connect with uh, an egregore or a higher power a god or a goddess and uh, the most initiatory bird is actually the bat um, so the bat is uh, the one who flies into the night who in a way can make connection with things which are unknown to you which are mysterious to you it's like the pluto influence and I think maybe because of this, because the bat was yeah, very much used also in Western shamanic tradition to make a connection with many spirits, it was very much associated with the devil by the, uh, yeah, uh, by the church later. Ah, okay. So uh, there's a remark here that um, yeah there was a journey with mushrooms and a python wanted to eat you but yeah you got out of it uh, yeah so yeah it is a missed chance um, yes and bad trips with ayahuasca um, what is important is also the um, always the reason why you're doing something um, if you have uh, a need for the power of uh, for instance the ayahuasca and the need is genuine uh, then generally the plant will recognize it its relationship with you it will say like I am here I exist I'm created to fulfill a purpose to use my power to heal people and if you uh, need me to, uh, to heal this, this is indeed a problem which is in my domain and I should do this, then I will do it. Uh, sometimes people want to uh, take the easy way. Uh, they want the ayahuasca to solve their problem instead of they solving their own problem. Or they try to take a shortcut instead of like doing my practices and meditation and working and discipline and diet uh, I just want the problem to go away quickly I'll use the ayahuasca and with its power it can solve all my problems instead of me working on it and this is generally the reason for bad trips so either the person goes into the ritual without having a good enough need or without having done enough themselves um, because the ayahuasca is there to help you if you cannot find a solution within your own reality 
So if you've done what you can within your reality, you've tried, you've done practices, you've read about the problem, you, you practiced and it still doesn't work, then the ayahuasca will help you. But if you don't do anything, you don't make the effort, then the ayahuasca well, will yeah, say you're in a way not respecting me, you're trying to abuse me, so I will not support you in this. And, um, but more often it is due to the quality of the shaman. Um, because in the ayahuasca process, um, by going into these higher energies, into these higher realms, you're also releasing um, a lot of lower energies. Because your consciousness is in a way separating itself from those lower energies. You de-identify de with your pain or with your lower vibrations. And if the shaman is not able to uh, purify this or to take this away, then these lower vibrations, which are meant to let go of, uh, can get a hold of you. It can also be a sign of that you're simply too weak. You're not ready to deal with your lower vibrations yet. Um, because in a way, by doing the ayahuasca ritual, you're initiating a challenge. You're saying like, okay, I will want I will face my problems, I will face my fears, I will face my lower vibrations and I will try to conquer them, to change them, to, to do that. But yeah, if you're too weak and the shaman is too weak, then ultimately these lower powers will yeah, maintain their hold on you. They are controlling you and they will continue controlling you. And uh, during the ayahuasca ritual, yeah, you can lose the fight. Um, so it is often good to uh, prepare. Um, in the, the, the South American tradition, uh, which I experienced in, in Ecuador, also the, um, and I talked also with the ayahuasca plant, and it considers this very normal, is that the shaman uh, consults the plant for every person who wants to take part of the ritual. And in, um, yeah, uh, by talking together with the plant, the shaman will say like it is good or it is not good for you to do this ritual and also decide which people are or are not allowed within the same group um, because everybody has to be safe. So it is very much the plant who has control over the ritual and the process and informs the shaman what he or she should do or how he or she should work with the contestants. But I noticed that many Western shamans, um, they don't do this or don't know how to do this. So they just organize a ritual, everybody who pays some money comes, and there's no real yeah, talk or, yeah, uh, it is very unprofessionally done. And because of this lack of skill, this lack of wisdom, this lack of yeah, cultural integration, cultural wisdom in the ritual, yeah, many people have bad trips. But um, a properly prepared and done ayahuasca ritual should never result in bad trips. Challenges, yes, but ultimately you should be ready for the challenge or you should not be allowed to do the ritual. Okay, I notice I'm getting a little bit uh, tired and groggy. So I think uh, we'll keep the rest of the questions uh, until next time again, um, which will be um, uh, yeah, the first Thursday in, uh, in September. So thank you all very much for, uh, for joining and the interesting questions. Oh, I uh, see one more thing coming up or two. Okay, oh. thank you. Okay, bye-bye.